In this lecture, I want to give a quick intro to stocks and talk about the mechanics of how a stock works relative to the ownership of a company and how they are traded. This is a course on options trading. So why are we talking about stocks? Well, if you know everything there is to know about stocks, feel free to skip this lecture. But it's very important to understand the underlying fundamentals of stocks because they are the foundations to options trading. Without knowing how a stock operates and how they work in the open market, options trading will make no sense to you. More or less, options are an advanced layer that sit on top of stocks. As an option moves, the stock moves. As the stock moves, the options move. Options tend to be a leveraged version of stock ownership. For example, if you own one options contract, you actually control 100 shares of the underlying stock. And typically, you buy the options contract for the fraction of the cost of buying the actual 100 shares. We'll learn a lot more about that in future lectures. And most importantly, options pricing is based on the underlying stock movement. Once again, if the stock goes up, the options price, or at least the call options price, will go up. If the stock goes down, the options price will go down. So options are directly correlated to the underlying price of the underlying stock. Because of that, the fundamentals of how a stock moves up or down is incredibly important. So far, I've used that term stock, but we haven't really defined what a stock is. Let's look into what a stock in a company is. Typically, when a company has more than one owner, you break the ownership interest up into shares. You might own one share, you might own many shares. The number of shares you own represents the percentage ownership you have in the company. For a publicly traded company, these shares trade on the open market, meaning you can sell your interest in the company or buy interest in the company at any time as long as the market is open. You do this through your stockbroker. A stock exchange quickly facilitates the buying and selling of shares. Party A can sell shares to Party B with only a few clicks of their online broker. This is the same with options trading, as there are options exchanges as well, which we'll learn about in future lectures. The term stock and shares are often used interchangeably. For example, if you say you own stock in many companies, you're just indicating that you own shares. You're not telling people how much shares you have, you just own stock in different companies. For example, you might say you own stock in Amazon and Microsoft. Now, when you talk about shares, you typically talk about the unit of ownerships in specific companies. For example, you could say you own 10 shares in Amazon. That means you own 10 units of ownership in Amazon. The term equity often refers to as the total ownership in a company. For example, if a company had 10,000 shares and you own 1,000 of them, you could say you own 10% of the company. You have, ten, you have a 10% equity stake in the company. So those are just some primer on some key terms, and we'll learn more about those as we go forward. Just to drive this idea home a little further, in the olden days, companies issued something called stock certificates. Nowadays, they do it digitally or electronically. A stock certificate was what you held to prove that you own the company. For example, if a company issued 100 stock certificates and you own 10 of them, you would own 10% of the company. And at any given time, you could sell all of them or some of them to someone else and reduce your ownership stake in exchange for the money they give you. To illustrate this a little bit on a pie chart, once again, if a company issued, say, 10,000 shares or stock certificates and you own 1,000 of them, you would own 10% of the company. And you could buy, sell, or hold those 1,000 shares as you see fit. That's the beauty of the open market. You can exchange your shares or stock certificates for money when you're ready to sell or disinvest from a company, or if you want to own more of the company, you could buy more shares. Now let's learn more about how stocks and shares and ownership works through our friends at Arrested Development. This is a TV show that I really like. You don't need to know anything about the TV show so, because I'll fill you in on the details you need to know for this illustration. In the TV show, they started a company called Booth's Frozen Bananas. And the whole family was kind of involved. The uncles were involved, the nephew was involved, and they ran this business as a family business. And since they ran it as a family business, they obviously all shared in the ownership of the business. So let's take a look at what that might have looked like. At the top here, we have a representation of the company. When they started the company, they needed $100,000. This $100,000 went to building the stand, buying the original inventory, maybe paying for insurance, everything they needed to get going. And to come up with that $100,000, each family member chipped in a little bit. So George chipped in $45,000, 
Job chipped in $15,000, Michael chipped in $25,000, and Buster chipped in $15,000, totaling $100,000. And as you can see, each member would own a different percentage of the company based on what they originally contributed. What they did was they issued 100 shares and made the shares worth $1,000 each. So since Job contributed $15,000, he received 15 shares. And this is how they defined and documented the ownership of the company. From their initial investment, they received shares that represented their ownership percentage in the company. Now let's explore the economics of the business a year later. It turns out they had a pretty good year. They brought in $80,000 worth of profit. Pretty good. As a good management team, they decided they wanted to take some of the $80,000 and reinvest in the business. Maybe they wanted to open a new location. Maybe they wanted to add new inventory. Maybe they wanted to try new product offerings. Whatever it might be, they wanted to grow the business by reinvesting the profits. This is called retained earnings, earnings you keep within the company to grow the business. They also wanted to reward the shareholders. So they took 10% of the profits and returned it to the shareholders. This is called a dividend. So in this case, 10% of the profits would be $8,000. And since we issued 1,000 shares, that'd be $80 per share. In the case of George, our largest shareholder, he had 45 shares, so it'd be 45 times 80. It would give him a dividend of $3,600. In the case of Job, he would receive $1,200. In the case of Michael, he would receive $2,000. In the case of Buster, he would receive $1,200. And you'll notice this is an 8% yield from their original investment. And we often talk about dividends in relationship to yield. In this case, Job invested $15,000. So 8% of $15,000 would be $1,200. So he just received in year one an 8% return on his original investment. That's called the dividend yield. Another interesting thing to consider is we only distributed 10% of the profits. That means $72,000 is in the bank account of this company. So we originally started the company with $100,000. So the company at that time was worth $100,000. But now we just added $72,000 to the bank account and we still have the original equity of $100,000. So now technically this company, the book value of this company is worth $172,000. So when we originally started out, the share price was $1,000 per share. But since we just added the $72,000 to the bank account, that increases the share price. So now the share price of this company is $1,720. Now, of course, the share price is only worth what someone else would pay. This refers to the book value of the company, what the company is worth if you sold all the assets of the company on the open market, not what someone would pay to buy the shares on the open market. Because this company will continue to make profits year after year and continue to give that dividend in, in all likelihood, someone might be willing to pay more for those shares in the open market because they know they'll get that future earnings power. So there's book value and what someone will pay for it in the market. We'll learn a little bit more about that later. But just want to point out that your investment makes up the dividend you receive every year in the increased value of the company. Owning a company or owning shares in a company represents more than just an economic interest in the company. It represents a controlling interest in the company as well. So let's say this company needs to make a decision. They want to know whether they should add nuts to their bananas or not. What they can do is they can put it, this up for a shareholder vote. And you get a vote based on the number of shares you own. So George, in this case, has 45 shares or 45% interest in the company. So therefore, his vote has a little more weight than anyone else's. You can almost think of this as George has 45 votes. And over here, Job has maybe 15 votes or 15% and so on. Michael has a 25% vote and Buster has a 15% vote. So when they put it up for vote, everyone gets to make their decision, yes or no. And then they tally it up based on their percentage ownership. So this is interesting. The largest shareholder doesn't necessarily control the company because as you can see, the largest shareholder was outvoted by a collection of the smaller shareholders. A company, in a way, is just another form of a democracy. And while it seems a little silly here to make a vote on whether you have nuts or not, shareholders make bigger decisions like who the CEO is and how to invest money and how to distribute dividends and so on. So ownership in a company is very important for control along with economic interest. I spoke earlier about the ability to sell shares in the open market. Let's explore what that might look like. 
Job decides he wants to sell his shares. Maybe he wants to buy a house. Maybe he wants to invest in something else. Maybe he doesn't agree with the direction the company is going. Maybe he's fighting with his other investors. He just wants out for whatever reason. So he sells his shares to Buster because Buster's interested in increasing his shares. He goes from 15 shares to 30 shares. But Buster can't pay the original $1,000 because the company went up in value. As we learned in that first year, it had $80,000 worth of profit. So we know this company can produce a dividend every year, so that's worth something, plus it has all that retained earnings. So we deem that the shares are now worth $1,500. So they went from $1,000 when the company started to $1,500 today. So what happens is those new shares, those $1,500 shares, are worth $22,500. So Buster has to give Job $22,500 for the shares, and Job hands the shares over. Buster ends up with 30 shares from his original 15. And to figure out his basis in the company, he would have to take the average of these two numbers. So now through this transaction, he increases his ownership. So his dividends will be bigger. His equity in the business will be bigger and his control will be bigger. He will have a bigger vote because now he got rid of one of the shareholders and he has a more interest via more shares. And Job made a nice little profit. Remember, he bought his original shares for $1,000, and now he just sold them for $1,500. So he had a 50% increase in this, plus the dividend he received. So that was a pretty good investment. <laughs>